This is Tony Mark. And this is Russell Grether of the Mark and Grether Group, and welcome to the Malibu Podcast. Malibu. This is Tony Mark and Justin Cumbie of the Mark and Grether Group. We're welcoming my friend Matt Rapp to the Malibu podcast today. We are starting a series um, called A People's History of Malibu. And so my idea of that is that the Malibu I grew up in in the 70s and 80s was very different from the Malibu of today. I still love the Malibu of today, but it is very gentrified. It is... Uh, significantly less Wild West. And I feel that the Malibu I love uh, has a deep and rich history, kind of like Yellowstone, of being a bit outlaw, of having these amazing and crazy moments in time. And so as part of the People's History of Malibu, I'm picking, as in my mind, like if the aliens came down and were dusting through the rubble in 2,000 years of Malibu. like They aren't here already? uh, Well... (coughs) If they come down next week and dusting through the rubble, the there's certain people in my mind that kind of personify the things that should be remembered in a people's history of Malibu. So for me, you in the 80s in the colony um, are kind of, you know, lived in this amazing moment. And um, so I'll quickly just let you introduce you. So Matt, introduce Matt. I am Matt Rapp. Uh, born 1962 in Malibu, well, in a hospital, but lived in Malibu Colony in 1962. Uh, was there for many years. I am a real estate broker in Malibu now, going on 35 years. A father of two teenagers and husband to Jill Rapp. I live here in Point Dew. Excellent. <clears throat> so the... The moment in time I kind of wanted to jump back into is, I guess we're going to call it the uh, the mid, early mid 80s. Mm-hmm. And um, you wrote a book, which I was lucky enough to read most of, called Trace Parties, which I'm going to ask you to talk about. Honestly, it is absolutely one of my favorite books, and I I can only wait for the day it gets published so I can read it over and over, like I read The Hobbit and Tolkien. But it's just this amazing story you wrote. You're a great storyteller. You have a great voice. And the stories just stand on their own. Even if you suck, they're such great stories. So I want to dive into that. But I was actually unaware until we start talking about having you on the podcast that you have even a much deeper family history of living in the colony. Um, So we're going to look at some of the photos. This is actually the first time we've ever uh, videoed a podcast. So we'll probably live to regret this. But the photos are so good, they stand on their own. And I thought it was worth including. So, um, but anyway, yeah, could you go back and just kind of talk about when your family's history of So my grandfather was, um, who sadly I never got to meet, was named Harry Rapp. Harry Rapp was a um, big wig at MGM Studios in the 20s and the 30s. Um, He's in a lot of MGM history books. And um, back when the colony was... Let's just see here. Back when Malibu was owned by Rhoda Mae Ringe, and um, it was empty. It was her thing. She had to fight the legal battle to prevent the railroad from coming through. So she opened up the Malibu colony um, to seaside rentals, um, and my grandfather was one of the early renters there in the 30s. Um, my father kind of got to know the colony in the 30s and the 40s. Um, here's a picture of him and one of his friends on the beach. Um, and he developed kind of a love for the beach. He became a fisherman. Um, 
So when he and my mom married, they bought a house in 1958 in the colony and raised my, raised, I, <laughs> I have five older brothers. Uh, they're all half brothers. They each came from different marriages of my parents. So um, photo of them in 1962. I'm the little squirt in that photo. So we were there and uh, I was born in 1962. Our family would move around to different places in the colony um, based on the, the size of our family at the time. My brothers were 12 years older than me, so some would go to college, some would go to boarding school. And uh, we, li we lived in about five different homes until we finally built number 120, which was at the south end of the colony. Uh, we built that in 1971. That was overlooking Surfrider Beach and Third Point and I was eight or nine years old. So I grew up surfing and I had this incredible house that, you know, that I was so fortunate to be raised in. And I'd walk out the door and I'd either go surf Third Point in the 70s or I would go to Old Joe's. And, but either way, I was, I was a beach rat. And um, so, you know, that's kind of the story. Uh, you know, just grew up there. The colony was a fantastic place to grow up. It wasn't as high profile or as shishi as it is today. There was a lot of families, a lot of kids, uh, and just a great sense of community. You know, you knew your neighbors. You could count on your neighbors. If there was a fire, everybody would caravan together. You know, out, uh, out. You know, we just we were just tight. You know, that's kind of my experience with Broad Beach in the late 70s and 80s it was you know more of a community the way I remember it anyway mm -hmm. and definitely uh, a less shishi and you know people would ride horses on the beach we used to ride our motorcycles on the beach as kids it was just you know ride our bikes down mm -hmm. to Trancas Bar and Grill and watch Neil Young and Crazy Horse play from outside and it was just a really amazing era in Malibu which I guess I'll always miss a bit you know um so I actually, again, had no idea about your deep, deep family history in there. And so, you know, growing up, we both come from real estate royalty. Um, you know, my dad and your mom, Carol, were really close. And I, I guess actually have a photo of my mom here. Cool. The great Carol Rapp. This is how she sold real estate in the <laughs> colony on her tennis bike, on her bike and her tennis shorts. My dad absolutely loved your mom, and so he would always tell me stories about real estate and how real estate, you know, that the people that thought they knew what they were doing had no idea because Carol Rapp sold more real estate than all of them put together, and she did it between tennis lessons when it was convenient on her bike, you know, mm -hmm. and that she absolutely ruled the colony, and that don't cross her, you know, don't <clears throat> don't get upset if you can't schedule a showing because you'll never get back in the colony, and but he adored her, and I think he really liked that she um, was just so unconventional and, and just did things so organically, you know, the way she did real estate. So, the feeling was mutual, as your dad was unconventional. Yeah, I mean, I remember my dad, when I got into real estate, he took me to this, like, really, they had a, had all the big wigs out. This was Fred Sands at the time. They had all the big wigs out from Beverly Hills and had this meeting in Malibu at one of my dad's listings, and they all show up in their, you know, polished cars and, shoots and suits and ties, and... My dad brought me. I was like, Dad, aren't you going to change? He's like, no, they're in my town now. And he showed up in, in sweats, like with his ass hanging out, this big Mr. Bill shirt on, like tear in it and ketchup on it. And like <laughs> that was how he rolled into the meeting. It's like, this is how I sell real estate. That's right. But he did cool stuff. Like he used to, you know, show property by kayak. Like he would, just, he would take his clients out in kayak and go up and down the beach and point out properties. And I think everybody who did a kayak tour bought a house because... You know, you were living the lifestyle, you yeah. know, and that was what was so cool about, that's what he loved about your mom, you know, it was like she just, she embodied the here's, lifestyle. Here's another great photo of her and my brother's kids at the lagoon feeding the ducks when the lagoon was healthy and there were ducks. <laughs> Probably are ducks. Not just... toxic ducks, not radioactive ducks. <laughs> yeah, it's not safe. Um, so, yeah, growing up, like, I always knew of you, obviously, but... You know, you had a a persona and uh, a great body of work that preceded you at the time. You know, I was I both liked you, but was also a bit terrified of you uh, growing up. 
which is probably pretty accurate, right? Um, <clears throat> I there there to this day are like Matt Rapp stories floating around that like I'm not sure true or not, but the stories that you're willing to tell are so good that I figured you know I'd like to go back to Matt Rapp 1984 um, and talk about your book Trace Parties. Could you uh, explain just quickly the title of the book? Yeah, so Trace Parties. Um, first of all, a couple of a little bit more some more photos. Um, I mentioned my father, who was a television producer, and he grew up, you know, in the colony with my grandfather. So here's a photo of my dad, probably 18 years old uh, in 1940, and then in the behind it is me and Andy Lyon and Nathan Baker in a little different style of board shorts 40 years later. And segueing into I think my Justin actually still wears those shorts. Yeah, you know, <laughs> short shorts are coming back. Justin right can, here. though. So here's my father and I at the same age, about 23. Uh, he's going to fight. Uh, he's in the Navy. He's, he's in World War II. He's on a sub chaser in the North Atlantic going to fight the Germans. And I, in that photo, am in my board shorts about to go fight the kooks at third point to establish dominance. So similar, similar, similar you know, story line. we, I grew up, you know, as I mentioned, I was surfing third point. I was a little kid and grew up with these larger than life surf figures. And, uh, and it was, they were sort of my second parents. I watched them, how they kind of ruled and established order and created equity, uh, etiquette and, and sometimes would have to crack the whip, you know, and, and it, it was ingrained in me. So somebody passed it down to them, you know, and they passed it down to us and we've passed it on. And and it was just sort of a, about respect. And um, it was just an understanding. It seemed things seemed to kind of work smoothly that way. And, and violators would be dealt with. And, you know, sometimes nicely, sometimes not so nicely. So... Um, you know, here's a photo of me, about 16 years old, surfing. That's the old Joe's Rock in front. Um, so growing up in Malibu, I mean, all any of the kids here will say the same thing. We were in a beach culture. And, um, you know, Malibu, as I say in my book, is kind of the opposite of real life. You, you grow up here retired. And then... You come out of retirement for a short time, hopefully to retire soon. And, you know, well, it's funny because it's like, uh, really, if we look at it and we look at our clients, people come here, they move here, they live here, they buy here after they've made it, mm. you know. And so, you know, we as kids didn't really understand it. We just thought we'd snap our fingers into being a studio head or something, you know, and slowly the idea that you had to work hard and you know, some of my brothers moved away. And I know other kids' uh, brothers who moved away because they thought it was not really reality. And I'm like, what? This is reality? I don't even know what's out there. I'm not leaving, I'm not leaving 90265. But, because we were also drawn to the ocean. It was the one place where everything made sense. So my book is, um, is about a time in, in the early 80s when, um, you know, I was going to college and I had to take a gap year. <laughs> Actually, it was a gap you mean decade you got, or two. You got thrown out of college? Because, yeah, you know, they weren't really interested in my study habits at UCSB. And you, uh, I got to tell your uh, famous UCSB quote. I tell everyone this quote. What? That if you can graduate from UCSB, you can do anything. You can do anything because everything they throw at you at UCSB, you either dodge and duck or you catch and uh what i love about the quote is that you didn't graduate initially <laughs> I didn't, uh, which is kind of what my book is about i went back to college in my 40s and uh but i i was asked to leave ucsb and i came home that summer to kind of reflect on my life and and get my act together and just kind of chart a new course however my parents were <laughs> planning on going to Europe for two months, either for a vacation or just to get away from me. So, you know, it's part of, there was this equation where like, empty house, 1983, 
punk rock, Valley Girls, Waves, or get your act together and have sessions with your psychiatrist, Dr. Bender, ironically named. So I thought I would incorporate both. <laughs> That's and real. We'll, yeah. Actually, it's really his name. <laughs> his name was Dr. Bender. And uh, so I'm 22, 23, vulnerable, <laughs> unsure of the world. And um, my friends converged and they helped me decide to have a party which turned into two parties, which turned into trace parties. And trace parties is the name because uh, I won't give it away in the book, but the housekeeper who was, her job was to protect the house. Her name was Philippa, God rest her soul. She was going to be matched against me, uh, me and my friends and her. And uh, she actually won. <laughs> she, you know, very Game of Thrones-esque. <laughs> Um, she was a shrewd but, operator. Uh, so we, it, the story is about, um, you know, and I showed you those photos. It's about, um, you know, it's a father and son story because there's a generational divide. My father was in World War II. I was in a war of my own making. We didn't understand each other. We didn't get each other. My mom loved me no matter what I did. And... Um, you know, it's a coming of age story. It's it's a, it's essentially about how you survive paradise. Now, there's like there's a few specific things from the excerpts you sent me that I love so much. So I wanted to ask you just about a couple of them, and then I know you had an excerpt. But mm -hmm. um, so when you get kicked out of the house, <coughs> um, social distortion. So were they in the book? Social distortion was that that summer, or is that? Uh, I don't remember. The no, fact but that the had, lyrics are peppered through. Yeah, the fact that you had social distortion play at any birthday party is legendary. Yeah. So that that counts for sure. So there's this uh, part in the book where you get caught, you know, you get outed for the trace parties and you mm -hmm. get thrown out of the house. So your, <laughs> so your version of getting thrown out of the house is you go live on the beach next door to the house and the uh, the maid, your mom has the maid bring you sandwiches so you don't start. <laughs> well, here's the story and this is... This is a big part of the story is that uh, um, the other main character, aside from my friends, is, um, I don't want to, um, his name was Chester, and in the book his name is Charlie. I don't want to call him homeless because he was more like he was dwelling challenged. Um, you know, he lived... Yeah, that he lived on the beach next to our house for 17 years. Um, and he was sort of the protector of the area between my mom's house and, um, and the lagoon. And he kept that. Let's see if I have a photo of him. He, he kept that. A bit like the mystical sage, too. Yeah, a bit like a mystical sage. He kept that area completely to himself. Um, here's Chester and I when we're older. Um, so, you know, he's, he's a bit of a foil for me in the book because I'll come to him with my high end problems and he's, you know, he's, you know, dealing with no toilet paper in the lagoon bathhouse or, you know, or being hassled by the, by the sheriffs. Um, but he, you know, he was somebody I was really fascinated and drawn to and he was a, he was, it was like a juxtaposition, a contrast between two societal ends. You know, there was the very wealthy in the colony, you know, the woman who didn't want to step on the beach because there was seaweed. And there was Chester, who was part of the ecosystem. And he had little, but he was so content. I love that part in the story where the maid brings you sandwiches and you offer it to Chester and he only takes half. I just yeah. thought that was such an amazing, like, Actually, the, that's not the, the. I'll clarify a little bit. So I used to see him, and I'd sit out from the kitchen and look at him, and I'm like, because when he first showed up, I was, I was like, who is this guy? There's a homeless guy next to the house. And he'd look up to me and he'd nod, and I'd duck. And eventually, I, I decided that I was going to meet him, and I went to talk to him, and uh, and we shared a sandwich. I made him a sandwich and he took half and we just talked. And he's like, you going surfing today? And I'm like, yeah, wow, this guy knows I surf. And and then, 
slowly he'd just kind of integrate my life and give me wisdom and and we'd just nod to each other and I just would observe him he he loved being there and he was just content and um he's part of the story you know he gave me a there's a great section of the book about him and uh no, he was a great character in your book. The other, um, is it fair to talk about Larry Hagman? Like, can we mention a few? Yeah, there? well. Well, there's one specific s- story. No, we're not going to talk about that story. No, no, the, it's short, it's short. Just that one part where you're tackling his plant. Can we talk about that? No, 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 we cannot. <laughs> You'll have to read the book. But I will say that. Um, well, there's a great, okay. I, if I can't tell the story. Here's Larry Hagman. Okay. I'll tell you about Larry Hagman. He was, he was, he, we lived on the south end of the colony, and he lived on the north end of the colony. He seems to be a character. He was a character. When before Dallas, he did I Dream of Genie. And I remember in front of his house was a 10 foot genie bottle. And I just thought, I haven't really been around life all that much, but I don't think this is normal. <laughs> so, you know, he was in, in the photo that I just showed you. Every Sunday, he would have a f- peace parade in the Colony Beach where his friends would carry a flag of the nation. That was my other thing. Like, my dad never carried flags of the nation down the beach. You know, he was too busy watching football or playing tennis. You know, but... And Larry took a vow of silence on Sundays. He wouldn't speak to anybody. <laughs> I'm not sure any of them were incapable of speaking, you know. Um, but they would walk down. So that was the kind of place the colony was. Just like you had this assemblage of characters. You had, you know, here's Malibu Joe, a classic photo of... You know, the original guy, you know, never took money from anybody, but he was always taking care of Wars Crumpled Suit. That's taken right next to our house. Watch the Little League games. But it was just this, you know, it was not cookie cutter. You know, the... Well, that's exactly what I loved about the book and like what I loved about Old Malibu and why I wanted to do this series. It just was such a different world, but I mean... In such crazy extremes. Here's a, how a teenager feels about their mother. <laughs> Spicoli years. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, what else you got? Um, I have the skateboarding photo from it's a great photo. where Tradnoy Restaurant would be. So this is 1975. There used to be an empty pool there, and we skateboarded in it. And yeah, again, that'd be where Tradnoy Restaurant is. Um, I have lots of... Uh, yeah, let's definitely get as many of the photos. And Weather photos. Um, you know, it seemed to me back then, as opposed to now, we had some really voracious storms. And um, the um, weather was king. You lived by the rhythms. And you could see in some of these photos, my parents built their house on stilts, on pilings in the colony, because they knew from the other houses that would get destroyed during storms when things would batter the bulkheads, that if you built something up above you wouldn't get destroyed but pieces of the colony houses during these big storms maybe they were el nino maybe they were before would just shake the house they just hit it hit it hard and then wow. there's a photo in there of, of surf rider beach covered with pieces of, of expensive bulkheads and pieces of colony houses and so you know, I learned early on just to be in tune with nature's rhythms and and just be fascinated by by what weather can do. It always had the upper hand. Well, back to the Larry Hagman for the uh, the planter that you may or may not have assaulted in his yard. What I loved about the end of that story was this ongoing relationship with your mom, who was just always loving, always protecting you. Obviously, was sharp enough to know what nonsense you must be up to but just chose to love you anyway but i love that uh you know she defended you on all those different counts to the end you know that she always had your back and just seemed so amazing even to chase larry away you know i thought that was a great section of the book yeah you know she my mom was lovingly in denial about um the scope of my transgressions and uh she uh she taught me a lot about, you know, loving your kids. She taught me a lot about never giving up on your kids, uh, loving them through whatever they go through. And, uh, you know, the 20s were a tough time for me, but, you know, because she loved me and my dad loved me and 
My dad was pretty gruff, um, and especially after the end of the Trace Party summer when they came home and they had forgiven me, they had forbidden me to have any parties, but I told him I, I had some barbecues maybe, and Philippe was like, no Mateo, Trace Parties. Um, you know, and I was kicked out, they still took me back in. And, uh, you know, my dad and I had to kind of come to an understanding about these different cultures and times we grew up in. And, uh, you know, because of them, you know, I always felt like I, you know, I wanted to get my act together because for myself, but I felt like I owed it to them, you know, for all they had invested in me. And uh, here is a here is a young Matt, slowly after getting his act together when he first started real estate. And I learned from my mom. You'll notice no punk clothing or eyeliner or dark circles under my eyes. Um, In that photo. Yeah. And um, so... Do you have any of the lifeguarding photos? I do have some lifeguarding photos. Um, So so the lifeguarding, the the colony lifeguards from... From us, our perspective as Broad Beach kids, you guys were kind of legendary. We kind yeah. of emulated what you did later on with something called Beach Patrol. But the colony guards yeah. were like, you guys were our, our folk heroes. So can you tell me a little bit about the guards? Sure. So the, the Malibu Colony lifeguards are a long tradition going back to when I was a little kid. I always wanted to, um, I always, there's my natural progression single fin and my red colony lifeguard shorts. Um this one is entitled Matt Rapp, Lifeguard on Duty. What am I doing on my parents' deck holding my surfboard for a Polaroid? Working. You know, who knows? <laughs> Safety first. But the Conley Lifeguards was this, these, these older guys when we were kids, and they were our older brothers, and we would hang out next to their lifeguard towers and their first aid kits and just listen to stories about legendary surf figures and, you know, mythical swells and... And just watch them, and, and I always hoped one day I would be a colony lifeguard. Um, so when I was about 16 or 17, I took the swim test and did all I needed to do to be a colony lifeguard uh, and convinced some of the head guards to let me and my friends like Andy Lyon and Nathan Baker and uh, some others to, to join me, which was my plan because they got so frustrated with us, they quit, and then I became head guard, and I ran the show. And... Um, was that, yeah. uh, did you take that over from Marcus Beck? Was Marcus old? Well, it was Curtis Beck. It was Curtis. Marcus Beck. Sorry, Marcus. You know, I mean, I did the best I could with what I had. Um, you know. So you kind of pushed him out? Mm, he I chose. Think he made a, I think he made a risk-reward decision, you know. And, um, but, you know, I wanted to surf. And I always thought the best way to save people would be to actually surf while I'm lifeguarding so I could be in the lineup in case anybody better, was drowned. Yeah, right? It actually makes sense. And yeah, an occasional nap would be all right. So, you know, we had this guy who ran the lifeguards named um, Ivan and he got sick of our shenanigans after five years and then I ended up hiring Pepperdine lifeguards. And But the problem was most Pepperdine lifeguards were good in pools, not in the ocean. And so the whole program disbanded in the, in the mid-80s. But it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, no, it sounds like an absolutely amazing cast of characters. Um, are we losing you soon? Soon. Are there any? I want to make sure we get all the photos that yeah. we. Yes. Last last few things, <clears throat> just some some of the Run Man photos uh, from the Trace Parties era. Um, Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, from my experience with Red Man, it was very similar to like my experience with Matt Rapp when I was younger. It was like these guys that I idolized, but I was also terrified of. And I did not actually know you were part of Run Man until today. It makes sense, but I was not aware of it. So Run Man was what? Morgan? Okay, Travis so Run Walker? Man, here's the deal. When I say I was part of it, I mean, Run Man was created by Ray Kleiman and Morgan Runyon. And they first started a board bag company called Run Man. And um, Runyon, Kleiman, Run Man. So Ray Kleiman came from Chicago and he moved. His dad married Ian Warner's mom. They lived next to me. 
Ray wasn't a surfer, but he was an incredible photographer, and he had an eye for the ironic, you know? And so he just started filming the Malibu culture and, and take surf videos of us at Third Point and in our lifestyle, and then we would get into, we'd go into Ian's room, we called it the cave, um, the cave at the back of the house, and, you know, everybody would gather and we'd watch these Super 8 movies, and they were just so classic. And um, so then he had this idea to make Run Man into a video. Uh, and it was the first one he made was Run called Run Man. So I was a DJ at that time at KBU. I had my own rec- show called The Mad Match Show. And so Ray pilfered all of my records and made the soundtrack for Run Man. Amazing. Mostly from my stuff. And, um, you know, and then later in, later in life, I became the minister of propaganda and I would write things for them and... But, it, you know, it's really the brainchild of them. And uh, I was just lucky to be a, a, a character cast in it. You know, um, here's kind of some photos from that time. I, you know, I think Run Man, that's punk rocking at the, uh, at the Colony Gate before a show in town. Um, what's the next one? Let's see. That's me. Oh, that's me. And uh, the Reagan mask. That's, that's Ronald Reagan uh, listening to Social Distortion playing tennis that's uh a drunken guy from over the hill getting absconded by the malibu green shorts uh during a surf contest we are and that's the famous tinfoil faces and the and castro's henchmen behind him i don't really know what the story was of that but it's real it wasn't staged they were looking for sun protection so and that's me and um andy lyon and i about to go do battle at third point um amazing so <laughs> so run man like i actually tried to look up some run man to show justin at one point and uh should i hold photos up or just let it be you can hold them up. i okay. think we're kind of done with photos all right well we got the good ones you know, me right. and my brother found run man on youtube you yeah. did find just it losing just psyching we watched like we watched it twice yeah it's amazing yeah. there were like three of them right run man, run man um all right thanks justin yeah um Run Man 2, He's, Run Man 69, and Run Mental. Run Mental. I never saw that one. I think there might have been four. Um, yeah, I remember two from your book, but it seemed like you hung out with some pretty legendary surf characters, too. Like Buttons comes in and out of your book, and from what I understand, you guys were actually pretty close friends. Yeah, Buttons and uh, another great guy, Louis Ferreira, who was uh, also a pro surfer. He was, and a shaper. Um, so they were... Friends with Ian Warner. Ian Warner was an incredible surfer. Uh, my next door neighbor, one of my earliest friends. Ian just always had more talent than anybody else. He was just born with surfing talent, surfing style. And Ian went on the ASP tour. Um, I guess it was the, was it the ASP tour, um, and you know competed in world tour events. He met Louis and Buttons, and uh, they kind of became friends and. Uh, Ian brought them home to Malibu and then it just so happened to coincide during the Trace Party summer where my parents weren't there that Louie and Buttons uh, didn't have a place to stay and so they kind of moved into the house and the rest is history and there's some classic tales about surfing at midnight and cords being cut at third point and just, just you know... <laughs> They, they were, they were, you know, they came from, you know, a place that wasn't, you know, was beautiful, but wasn't so affluent, you mm-hmm. know, and so they scrapped and, and clawed their way to where they were. Buttons was to us, you know, the greatest, one of the greatest small wave hot dog surfers of, of our time. I love surfing with him. I loved watching him surf. And Louis also, but Louis is more of a big wave surfer, but. You know, he would rip in small ways, but he they, he would also give me life advice, you know, and tell me to make connections and get in the movie business and what he would do if he had this opportunity. And, you know, Louie and I are, are tied to this friend to this day. Um, you know, I just saw, you know, I just saw him a couple of years ago. He was, you know, we met, he's always giving me advice when we ate, when we met, he's like, go to the salad bar, Matt, go to the salad bar. Go to the salad. I don't want any salad. Matt, go taste the salad bar. Matt, it's really good. You touch me on the arm. Matt, go to the salad bar. 
Yeah, of Salabar. So, uh, and then Buttons came here. Buttons got um, cancer um, a few years back. I guess maybe, God, maybe 2015, 2016. I have to look it up. And I heard about it, and he was not doing great. So I set him up with a place to live at my friend Simone's house, and uh, he stayed there while he sought treatment. And um, it was a great time. It was it was not a great time, but it was really good to see him and his wife, Hiriata, and their kids. Um, and I got to spend time with him, you know, in his final days. And, uh, you know, he was, we talked a lot, and then he passed away at uh, St. John's Hospital. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I used to watch uh, videos of Buttons, like, in, you know, late, I guess it'd be late 70s, early 80s, all those years. And, like, he was the surfer we were always most blown away with on the video. He just was, like, nothing else. He was like the Jimi Hendrix of surfing, you know. Yeah. He just had this whole different deal he was doing that, you know, was just unbelievable what he could do on a wave, on a surfboard. We always loved watching him. So I thought that was really great. You actually knew him as a person. I have a picture of him on my wall, and he wrote on there, keep surfing. You know, like, that's stay in the water. Um, so back to the book for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think you brought an excerpt, and I wanted to ask you, you could read an excerpt, but I wanted to ask you one more question before sure. the excerpt. So in the story with the trace parties, it, it sounded to me like you had pretty much, you know, for the tra <laughs> trace parties, like it was a... Uh, almost like a UCSB street party in terms of like who got in. And it sounded like those parties got to pretty chaotic levels. How did anybody infiltrate a colony party, you know, with the security and everything that they had in there? Would you guys like tell them to open the gates or would you invite girls that brought guys or? Well, a lot of them came in through the public beach. Oh, they would just walk in. Yeah, but we, we held it down. We wanted to keep the ratio about... Responsible. Yeah, and mostly guys we knew, and but you know it ended up being kind of a that was uncontrollable, you know, and um, so so they would just flow in from flow there. in, and then we had a big debacle. We had some brawls when people showed up that they that weren't in, 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 invited, and there was a kind of a giant brawl in my mom's flower garden, and um, you know. And, that's in the book also. I remember that. That was a good story. Um, and then just quickly, the social distortion tie-in. I'm a big social distortion fan. And it sounds, so you said you met Mike Ness uh, at the Whiskey back when they were getting started. And it was, was it your birthday party they played or a friend's so, birthday party? <clears throat> social D started, I guess, early 80s, maybe 80. I didn't know. I didn't, you know, I didn't met, meet Mike until maybe... 84, 85 at the Whiskey, they were kind of starting to get into, I remember when I met him, he had a hairnet on, like like a cholo, and they were they were doing, you know, they had released their first album. Um, was that Mommy's Little Monster? Mommy's Little Monster, and they were doing, they're working on the second album, and they were kind of going to more of a, like a, a country punk thing That's that was just really cool. But I met Mike at the Whiskey, and, um, and you know, we both... Uh, had a lot in common and so we started talking and we would talk here and there and then my friend Bungie the great Bungie Reed Danielle Reed of Malva Road was who was my one of my dear dear friends all the little punk goddess we used to go to so many shows she has a whole family uh talented family brothers in punk bands and we you know we just we <laughs> that's a whole nother thing but that that time um she would kind of take care of me and babysit me when I needed taken care of. She had her birthday party. So she said, you know, I, said, I want to do something nice for her. So I said, I'm going to get Social D to play. And uh, so I called up Mike and he's like, sure, you got 500 bucks. And I'm like, yeah. So Social D played her party on Malibu Road for $500. And it was amazing. Um, I still have some you know, record tape cassettes of that. Um, That's cool. It was incredible, yeah. I, I needed that, thank you. Um, so, I mean, the book, honestly, like, it's one of my favorite books. Like, I, <clears throat> I'm going to ruin my real estate career because I'm going to send it to everyone I know once you get it out, and then you'll probably take all my clients, but it'd be worth it because the book is so amazing. Well, so, I'm, I'm currently, it's been edited. It's been, it's, it's in manuscript form. I'm working on getting it to some 
you know, the publishing world, which is an, an interesting, you know, sea to navigate. I see it more as episodic TV when I've watched all these things on yeah. Netflix. It could go on for, for seasons, but I need to get it out there as a book. And then I'm very, you know, protective of it. So wanted to go to the right publisher and then we'll see where it takes off. I've got some interest in it from some producers and we'll see. I'm just taking my time. It's a learning process. Um, so do you have an excerpt you could read? I do. Um, I don't want to keep you here all day, but do you have like, you know, uh, three, four minutes of something you could read? Yeah, us? so I will do... Are there photos in there that I should show? Well, I will do... Um, Let me hold it up to the camera real quick. Okay. Well, that's a good shot of you. This is an excerpt. It was... It was published in a magazine some years ago, and it's... How did I miss this? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. So, um, I will read this. It's about Chester, the next-door neighbor, the dwelling challenge, my dwelling challenge neighbor. And um, so it's an excerpt on the from him. And, um, you know, his name is Charlie in the book. Everybody's name in the book is changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> although nobody was innocent. So um, here we go. And you can kind of give me a... Yeah, no, have at it. Yeah. Chester was our next door neighbor, sort of. He was a beach nomad who had finally settled down and claimed his plot of sand along the shelter of our house on the public beach. He and his cardboard bedroll were a calming fixture for the last 10 years. I counted on the consistency of his present. Occasionally, I sought out his counsel. This was one of those times. I was officially kicked out of the house. Mom and Dad had come home from their summer trip to Europe. They had a great time until they walked in the front door and realized I had turned their house into a nightclub. Mom knew instantly. All moms know instantly. They can identify deviant odors like a bloodhound. As much as I had tried to clean up, she could smell every beer that had been opened up during their two-month getaway. Dad's face turned artery red and his quivering finger pointed towards the front door. Now I was homeless and forced to survive the harsh elements of a Malibu September night. No movie channels, no blackout shades, no down comforter. Oh my God. I bought a Johnny's pizza and found Chester staring at the nighttime ocean the way most people watch TV. He had weathered skin, dark brown from endless, endless exposure, exposure to the sun, long black hair that hadn't seen a barber in decades, along with a straggly beard housing remnants of meals and the occasional seaweed strand. He had a collection of tattered visors, his favorite being a blue one that read Malibu Racquet Club across the front. He was, his dark hypnotic eyes hinted at a trove of enlightenment, enlightenment or a buried past not to be exhumed. The elements are constantly in transition along the Malibu coast. The colored spectrum of the sea changes with the moods of the season. The beach sand is torn away during big swells and gently offered back in the calm that follows. September's sun makes surf rider sand sparkle like a spread of diamonds, while under the rampage of Fe February floods, the beach is swallowed up in a brown torrent as Malibu Creek and the ocean become one. Giant kelp bales are heaved under the sand after pummeling cold fronts and then crackle under trampling feet come August. Piles of driftwood and ripped out pilings are littered along the coast after storms, storms take their toll. In spite of the elusive meanderings and extreme poundings, the one constant that remained was Chester. Every morning at, he was up at 7 a.m. He'd take his ancient trunks, black trunks off, hang them on our pilings and swim out in front of our house for his morning bath. He was a man of mystery and didn't say a lot. On other days, he offered pearls of wisdom, like when I asked him how he braved the elements without getting ill. Weather doesn't make you sick. People do. He was not much of a socializer, and when other nomads came looking for a place to settle down on the beach, his vibe clearly stated that between the Malibu Lagoon and our house, those 200 yards belonged to him. With him, we always felt safe. The colony dogs loved him. They conjugated around him like a great swami. When their masters went to work or shopping and the housekeepers went about their daily cleaning rituals, the dogs flocked to Chester. At the end of the day, many housekeepers would go to Chester's spot to retrieve the family dog. 
I liked Chester. He was like family, without being related to me, and of course all of the problems that came without. I, as I went out onto the beach, he had a bonfire going and I walked past it for a front row seat at the nighttime pool gardens. The water was an inky black until a wave would roll over the rocks and then loft a small net of frothy white landing back in the dark water, slowly expiring until all that remained was a stray bubble. I sat down next to Chester with my pizza, which he noticed first, then slowly nodded at me. He seemed so complete, so secure, like the emperor of an atoll. Oftentimes I would look at him from our kitchen window, sitting contentedly on his ragged towel next to the copper tone trash can, and wonder if he had more wealth than any of his colony neighbors. We all had our frontage, our square footage, our cars, our decor, our stuff, but stuff breaks. Nothing Chester had ever broke, so he never had a complaint. How can you suffer from lack when you don't lack every minute, when you don't lack anything? Everyone else paid millions to be here except Chester. I'm sure they all thought he was nuts, but I think it was the other way around. His cable never went out, his phone never died, his wife never freaked. No roofs, no leaks, no problem. Gen genius next to the ice plant. I love it. Uh, there's more, but you know. No, I get the idea. I, I literally just have to send it to everybody I know when you get it published. It would make an amazing Netflix show too, so I hope it all happens. Yeah. I think you got to publish it as a book too, though, because I just love your writing. Like it's it's really rich and great. Thank you. Um, well, we pretty much covered everything that I wanted to cover. I am so grateful. Yeah, uh, you've always been one of my heroes, and now you've become my friend. And I really appreciate likewise, you being on the podcast. Likewise. Thank you for being our first installment of a People's History of Malibu. It's my pleasure. And as I told people, on you know the some friends running for city council. A few years back, um, when you come here, don't try to change Malibu. Let Malibu change you. Amen. Amen. Matt Rapp, thank you for being on the Malibu Tony, podcast. thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. I'm Tony Mark. And I'm Russell Grether of the Mark and Grether Group. Thank you for joining us on the Malibu podcast. Malibu. Malibu. Malibu.